My message titled this morning, If I Had Six Months to Live. Romans chapter 13. Now, Father, I thank you, God Almighty, for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Lord, this is a late hour, and there's much to do. Give us the grace to hear this, the strength to want it, and the sense to walk in it. Father, I thank you for the touch of heaven on my life, for giving me the strength that I need, Lord, to speak this word to your people. Lord, I thank you for this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. If I had six months to live. Romans chapter 13, beginning at verse 11. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Now, we studied last week the life of Jonah, and we saw that even though Jonah was a, a called man of God, he was a genuine man of God, he was a prophet of God, he could actually hear the voice of God, yet Jonah fell asleep. And we studied the reasons, there are several reasons why a spirit of slumber can overtake a true child of God. In the life of Jonah, we studied that overtly resisting, obeying God in something you know he has asked you to do will bring a spirit of spiritual slumber on you. For those that are here this morning and you're looking for a fresh touch from God, you're looking for strength from God, you're looking for encouragement from God, but yet there is something that you know that you have to do, but you steadfastly resist God. And that's exactly what Jonah did. He, he went in exactly the opposite direction of the direction that God was asking him to go. And subsequently, in the time of storm and crisis that uh, developed all around him, he was found asleep in the lower parts of the vessel that was carrying him. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 10 and 11 says, Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that travels and thy want as an armed man. Now, now that, that's complicated in the King James language, but really what it means is those who fall asleep spiritually uh, are like people who are traveling on a journey and they're spending constantly what they were given, but there's no source of income. And so eventually there's a, there's a poverty that, that is deep, it's dark, and it's a despairing poverty comes upon them. Think of the prodigal son for a moment. He didn't head out away from his father broke the scripture says he received an inheritance. And so he probably had a, a significant amount of money with him. And he headed out with this inheritance and he started spending it lavishly everywhere. And he, he denied himself no pleasure. And he, he associated with friends that he shouldn't have been. And it was only, I think, I don't know how far down the road he got before he ran out of money. And uh, the scripture says a famine came into the land, but he himself was in want. And God forbid that when this world is spinning into times of crisis and hardship that you and I should be found ourselves starving, that we should be found unsatisfied without a word, with no direction. The people he was associating with were in the same hardship he was in, but he had no direction for them because he had gone far away from the heart of his father and he had spent his inheritance without replenishment because he was doing the wrong type of work. So we see that resisting the will of God, resisting something that you know God has asked you to do can bring about a spiritual slumber, which is not a condition that any of us want to be found in in this time that we're living in. There's a second type of sleep that can happen, and perhaps some are experiencing this today, 
In Luke chapter 22 and verse 45, let me just read it to you. It's talking about Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. It says, when he rose up from prayer and he was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. Now, that's the type of person who the intensity of the battle is too great. And although your intentions are good, there's, there's not enough strength to follow through. Peter said to Jesus, everyone may deny you, but I won't. They all might run, but I'll fight to the death. Wherever you go, I'm going to go. And, and you know, we, we all from time to time make those kind of suggestions to the Lord. But when it came down to it, he found himself in a battle that was too strong for anything of, of human nature. Paul says in Romans 7, 18, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I, I, I don't know how. I, I can't find the strength. I know what to do. I know what I should be doing. And I, I've tried to do it. Now, Peter took out his knife or sword and he cut off a high priest's ear. He, he really gave it the best as it is of, of, what, of what humanity can, can conjure up to advance the kingdom of God. But it only left him in sorrow and confusion. And there are people here today, you're, you're asleep for sorrow. You've tried, you've wanted to try. You've, you've, you've gone to prayer meetings. You've, you've done what you think you need to do as much as you know how. And a sorrow and a slumber has come upon you because you've come to actually a wrong conclusion that there's no hope. You'll never change. You'll never get out of this way of thinking or believing or doing or the, the frailty or weakness that's on your flesh. It'll always be part of you. And it has taken away your thirst for the word of God. It's taken away the vibrancy in prayer. It's taken away from you the excitement of waking up this morning, looking forward to a new day in God. All of that is gone. And now you're just coming to church and just more or less hoping for some kind of peace and some kind of reassurance, even though you don't see a lot of personal hope for the future. Proverbs 10 and verse 5 says that he that sleeps in harvest is a son that causes shame. Now there's a, second, a third type of slumber that can come to a person's life. And it's when the longings and pursuits of, of our hearts are not in line with the one who has called us to walk with him and work with him on the earth. We're, we're, we're doing things, but it's not, it's not what God has for us. Now, we're, we're, we're towing God along as if we've, we've got him on a cart with a rope, and we're kind of pulling the knowledge of Christ with us through this city and through this world, but realistically, we're leading him. He's not leading us. And, and we're not doing the work that he's called us to do. This is a day of harvest. This is a season where people have an inner cry for truth. This is a time when God wants to revive a city. But we are, we're not yet ready to do what he has asked us to do. And it can cause us to fall asleep in one of the greatest moments of history. And I do believe that we have come there. Now my question today for you is that if you knew today that you had only a few months left to live, what would you do differently? Well, I mean, just think about it for a moment. If, if you got the news on Monday, you, you had gone to the doctor and the doctor called you in and said, you, I'm sorry to tell you this, but at best you have six months left to live. And you found yourself here this morning having gotten that bit of news. What would you and I do differently than we are doing today? I remember having been invited to speak to a group of businessmen just about a few months before the Twin Towers were attacked and came down. And I was supposed to be, it was not a Christian event. I was supposed to be there to ask them to consider giving to the cause of feeding children in Africa. But I remember getting up and the burden of the Holy Spirit came upon me. And instead of asking them for money, I talked to them about a debt that they owed that they could not repay. They allowed me to speak to them for about 25 minutes. And at the end of the message, an urgency of the spirit came upon me. And I said to this group of businessmen and women who are very successful in the financial world, this is what you must do. And kept saying it again. It just kept coming into my mind. This is what you must do. I didn't ask them to pray the sinner's prayer. I didn't, it was not a, an event where they were expecting to hear the gospel. But I kept saying, this is what you must do. 
And it was only a few months later that 17 of the people in that room found themselves inside the towers and 17 of those people died. Now, some of them had a moment to get right with God. And those words, that my prayer is that as they looked out the windows into what was going to be eternity, they were an hour away in many cases from eternity, that they would remember those words, this is what you must do. This is what you must do. And I can't help but wonder, you know, most of these folks were second and two and three rungs from the top of the ladder. They were wealthy. They were successful. But I can't help but wonder, looking out that window at that last moment, what did it matter then all of a sudden? That promotion. Or maybe they're on the 97th floor. And what does it matter if they didn't make it to the 99th floor? Everything changes in a moment of time. When, when the realization hits that James, the apostle, said this life is a vapor. It is, it is here just for a moment and then it vanishes. Just like when you go out on one of our cold winter days lately, and if you see two people in conversation, when they speak to each other, you'll notice a vapor come out of their mouths. And when you and I get to eternity and we look back from eternity upon our lives, we'll realize in the scope of eternity what we thought seemed to be forever was just a vapor. It was only just a moment. It was, it was just an expression. It was just something which could represent evil or it could represent good. It could be selfish or it could be loving. It, it, and I, my prayer is lately, God, make my little breath as it is of a life count for something in your kingdom. Help me, O oh God, that I can represent you among men in my generation. We are all on borrowed time. I was thinking this morning as I was praying that I, I can remember as clearly as yesterday when I was five years old. I used to go out in my parents' backyard and they had a little patio there and I'd lay down in the patio and I'd stare up at the heavens and, and everything seemed so majestic and so wonderful and so awesome and so grand and so far away and it seemed like life was going to go on forever. And yet I'm 57 today and, and as God lives, it's like I've snapped my fingers and I've come from 5 to 57 and the next time I snap my fingers you're going to be in heaven folks I just realized that as I was praying it all goes so fast it, it all and, and periodically I like to visit cemeteries around uh, New York City or in various places and just walk through the cemetery and uh, because I don't know who these people are but I know a lot of them thought they were really important a lot of them had dreams, aspirations, and goals that may not have been in line with God. A lot of them in times past were churchgoers. Uh, some of them have really nice tombstones. Others are relatively mediocre. But I guarantee you they're all in the same, they're all in the same place. It's, it's all level underneath whatever looks to be really good on, on the top of the ground. I, have, uh, I bought a grave plot for myself a few years ago. I got it on sale actually. And, uh, <laughs> So um, I, uh, I was actually getting a great plot for somebody else, and uh, they were just so cheap, I just couldn't resist. I bought one. Uh, there's a stone on it. It's got my name on it. And so I go visit it once in a while, and I stand on my own grave. And I say, listen, you, lest you get proud, unless you start thinking you're something you're not, you're standing on your own grave right now. So just remember, this is where you're coming. Hallelujah. Not a bad idea. Some of you may want to consider that. If there is something different that you would do if you knew you had six months to live, I guess the question begs itself, why are you not doing it now? What prevents us? Now, I, I asked this question to my own heart, and I asked it honestly. If I knew I had six months to live, what, what would my value system be? What would be really important to me? And I listed it down as, as honestly as I can. Number one, people would become very important to me. That, that is happening. I thank God for that. The thought of being separated just from a, for a time would bring pain. I think of my three grandsons. I think of my children. I think of my daughters-in-law and my son-in-law. And I, th I think of my wife. I think of, I think of my family. 
the, the thought of being separated, I, I'd want to hug them, I'd want to love on them, I'd, I'd want them to know I cared. I'd want, I'd, I would want to encourage them that we would see each other again. The thought of being eternally separated would bring alarm into my heart. The thought that there would be some perhaps who are not walking with God that I would never see again. I would do everything in my power. And I, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about within the realm of being godly, I'd do everything in my power to see them come to Christ so that I would not lose them for eternity. The Bible says that Noah built an ark to the saving of his house. And building that ark means persistence. It means dedication. You have to have a singleness. He was 100 years in, or so building this thing. And you have to have a singleness of the eye. You have to be willing to endure the scorn of a degenerate society. You, you have to be willing to walk through what others don't understand. But he saved his house. It is, he built it to the saving of his house. I would begin to understand how God feels about his children and stop putting away from my mind the tragic day when sin separates the lost from God forever. The way I feel about my children, my wife, my grandchildren, the way I feel about my family is, is, is only a, a minuscule fraction of what God feels for humanity. The day coming when the books are finally closed, when the, the last casket lid has come down, when it's all over, there, there is no more redemption. There is no more chance to get right with God. And the, the ache, the pain in the heart of God, I can't even begin to touch that pain in God's heart. Maybe, perhaps, have you ever thought it might be the only thing that actually holds back his hand? From, from just, just closing it all now, it's just the, the thought in his heart that there are still multitudes in the valley of decision. There's, there's still those that haven't decided where they're going to spend eternity. There's, there's still those whose hearts are open, still those who can be reached through his church on the earth. But there is a day, there is a day, and the, the scripture says the Lord descends, there's, he comes with a shout, and uh, part of that is a shout for the redeemed, but part of it is it possible, it's a cry of agony for those he has lost, who are, are, are destined for an eternity in a place where God is not. And that's deeper and darker than anything in my mind can even begin to fathom. If I knew I had six months to live, I'd want to make right every known wrong. Romans 13, verses 12 and 13. The Bible says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. If I was in a wrong relationship, I would get out of it. Amen. Let me tell you that right now, young people. If you're in a wrong relationship, get out of it and get out of it now. I'd walk honestly, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness. Now, chambering means... Here's what chambering means. Chambering means uh, somewhat as it sounds. It means secluding yourself away in a room with a person who is not your husband or not your wife for the purpose of sexual intimacy. And wantonness means the desire to do it again. This unbr unbridled desire. Now here's, I want you to hear me on this. Young people, I want to speak to you as a father. I want you to let me do that now. I'm, I'm going to speak to you as if you're sitting in my living room and I was your father. And I want you to hear me very, very clearly on this. Now, a lot of young people in New York City, you want to be single. And that's understandable. And the Apostle Paul said, if, if you're able to contain yourself, there's nothing wrong with that. But you have a career in mind. You have a certain worldview. And for whatever reason, maybe it's a bad family experience, that family is, and marriage is really not part of your thinking at this time. But you also want relationships with other people. And those relationships quite often are sexual relationships. And so your Christian life looks something like this. Have sex, ask forgiveness. Have sex, ask forgiveness. Have sex, ask forgiveness. And now it's down to have sex, go to church. Because the, the, the longer you do something wrong, it starts to become right. Because the judgment of God doesn't fall, you think just like Samson did. 
Have sex, wake up, your strength is still there. Have sex, wake up, your strength is still there. Not realizing one day he just went too far and he woke up and his strength was gone. If I was in a wrong relationship, I would get out of it. And I want you to hear me on this because it's for your life. Samson didn't know that she was playing for his life. This was a dangerous game that he was playing and the spirit of the Lord will not strive with man forever. If I was in a wrong or a doubtful practice, I would get out of it. Now there's some things Paul says are lawful, but they have no profit to them. For example, you will not find me skipping church to watch a football game today. You would not find me skipping church to watch a football game. If I was not a pastor, I would still be in the house of God. Some things are lawful. But they're of no profit. You go ahead if you want. You watch a bunch of grown men chase a piece of pigskin around a field. <laughs> and then give their interviews at the end. They're all the same. You can record one and play it for the rest of your days. They'll all sound the same. But I will not be found outside of the house of God. There's some things that are lawful. There are, there are doubtful practices. There are a lot of Christian people who are seeing how far they can push the line with alcohol. They're quoting the scriptures. They're, they're getting sermons online that talked about how Jesus turned water to wine. So obviously this must be a great thing to go out to a bar on Saturday night. And they're trying to push the envelope on these things. But I want to remind you that those that were used of God in the scriptures, there was a definitive mark, especially on the Nazarites and on those that were set apart for God. And that was that... Alcohol and strong drink did not touch their lips. And folks, I'm telling you, if you want to be a voice for righteousness, there are some decisions you have to make. Yes, there, it might be a cultural thing to have a glass of wine with your meal. And, and I'm not anybody's judge over these things, but you're not going to find me at that table. I'm not going to that table. I want these lips to be unhindered. I don't want anything to hinder the word of God. There are, there are practices that are just doubtful. And there's just something inside when you're involved that always pricks your conscience. It doesn't matter like how many times you go to a counter scratching some lottery thing, telling yourself how much you're going to give to charity if you win the $145 million one day. To pacify, there's something inside of you that says it's not right. There's just something that never goes away. That's why you have to justify it constantly. If what you're doing is right, you don't have to justify it. There's a peace. You don't have to look over your shoulder wondering if the pastor is going to walk in while you're doing it. There's a peace in the heart. If, if I were involved in anything doubtful, I would put it away. Psalm 1, let me read it to you. It says, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither, and everything he does, whatsoever he does, shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous." For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Thirdly, I would be reconciled to God and man as much as is humanly possible. Now, there are some cases it's not, and I understand that. But I would be reconciled to God and man. I'd want to go out of this life with a clean slate. I would at least want to say I tried to make peace, even if peace wasn't possible. I tried. I would not want to be in the seat of the scornful. It takes no strength to scorn. It takes strength to build up Amen. and to hope for the best. And just as Peter did, I would give up trying to walk in my own strength. I would seek Jesus until his promise of strength is mine. Paul says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. I would give up trying to walk in my own strength. Why should I walk in my own strength? 
I mean, Jesus Christ promised me the power that I need Amen. to be it. But you see, the power of God doesn't come to those who won't make the break. We, we have to make the break. It, it's so pointless to ask for the power of God if you're simply going to go back to your old way of doing things. The, the power of God came to people in an upper room who had made the choice to be witnesses for God, even if it killed them. They made the choice to make the break from a religious society. They, they made the choice to, to walk through the scorn of those that had just crucified their Savior. They made the choice to love people even though people were not very lovable at that time. They, they made a choice that, that only God could make. Only God could give them the strength within them to follow that choice. They had just seen a Savior that had gone to a cross and he'd gone there with mercy in spite of the treatment that fallen humanity had given him. And they made the choice to follow him. And having made that choice, they gathered together in an upper room with this promise, you shall receive power after the, that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. I will give you power, the Lord said. For those that are separated to me, for those that are willing to walk my way, for those that are willing to enter into my work, for those that are, will choose not to resist the things that I've asked you to do, for those who will adopt the value system of heaven, for those who will begin to see people the way God sees them, for those that make the choice to walk away from sin and everything that hinders the life of Christ from flowing within us to reach a fallen and darkened humanity, for those whose value system falls in line with the heart of God, he says, I will give you power. The promise is as real today as it was over 2,000 years ago. I'll give you power. God has not changed. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Not everybody got the power of God. I'm sure there's a multitude of religious people everywhere in that generation. But 120 that were serious received the power of God for the purposes of God. And many of them died for having the power of God in their lives, but they changed the whole known world. 120 people. You imagine in Times Square Church if 8,000 people got serious with God? If 8,000 people went into the presence of the Lord and said, I will not come out until I have the promise of your power. Now speaking in tongues is part of that. Thank God for that, but that's only an evidence. It's all that is, an evidence. The power is evident in a holy life, a transformed life, the ability to walk and do everything that God calls us to do and to be. When I was a young Christian, I walked for about two years in mixture until I got sick of it, until I realized I've got to put both feet on one side of the fence. I got so tired of the powerlessness, so tired of of singing the songs in church and singing very few outside. I, the desperation came into my heart. I said, Lord Jesus Christ, I want to live for you. I want to honor you. But I don't have the strength. But I will serve you if it kills me. And I remember praying that specific prayer, I'll serve you, God, if it kills me. Now, I was heading out to do it in my own strength. I didn't know any better. But God in his mercy just sovereignly met me. I had a sovereign encounter with the Holy Spirit that changed my life forever. He saw the cry of my heart. He saw that I wanted to live for God. I wanted it with everything. I wanted the power to do right, to act right, to think right, to, to be godly, to be an honest and godly man. I wanted the power and I knew I needed something outside of myself because the deepest resolutions of my heart were worthless. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I knew what to do, but I couldn't do it. But he came. And I want to implore you today that you must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Not just for the sake of walking out of the church and saying, wow, was that ever fun? 
But you walk out of the church and you are a transformed man. You're a transformed woman. You, you have within you the power to do right, to think right, to walk right. Your, your priorities are right. Yes, you still have to work and pay the bills and have an apartment. I understand all of that. But everything is in its right place now. You're, you're not looking at people as if they're just trees walking down the street. You don't have a half of a spiritual vision. You now see people the way God sees them. We're in the last moments of time as we know it. Now, I don't know how long that's going to be. And I don't think it's going to be as long as we think. And maybe six months is not a stretch after all. But irrespective of that, we should live each day because, as if it's the last. And I want to give an invitation for people today who have heard this. And in your heart you say, I, I, I'm weak. And you, you, just, you just, I could swear that you were in my living room listening to me and watching my life. But I want to walk with God. This isn't a game for me. I want to make a difference. I want my little vapor of a life to count for something in eternity. I don't want to look back and be ashamed of what I thought and did and where I went. I want to walk with God. I want my life to make a difference. I don't want my Christianity to be confined to church on Sunday. I want to be a Christian seven days a week. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to tarry. We're going to wait in the presence of God today. We're going to just, I'm going to invite those who want to, to come forward. If this is something you really feel that God would have you to do, in the annex you can step between the screens. But we're going to take about 20 to 25 minutes and just worship. Ask God to fill you with his Holy Spirit. Ask him for the power to do right. Confess your sin. Ask for forgiveness. Get that out of the way. And ask him for the strength not to return to it. To be a different man, a different woman. There's, not, there's no religion can reach this city now. It has to be Jesus Christ in a church, in a people. There's nothing else will touch the city. This is serious. I'm as sober and serious as I've ever been in this pulpit. This is a serious moment. It's for those who just say, and you don't have to be strong. You can be weak, but you want to be strong. You want that strength. God promises to give that to you. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. It's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own power. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Let's get up and make your way down to this altar, please. Do it now. Father, Lord, we ask you that you have mercy on New York City and send us to them. Send us to the people. Send us into the marketplace, the workplace, all the boroughs, all the five boroughs of the city. Lord, you, you said we were to be salt and light. And you know and we know we can't do this without your power. And so we ask you to be merciful to New York City. Be merciful by coming to your people, and giving us the power that we need to stand and to make a difference in our generation. We can't do it, Lord, in our own strength. The forces against us are too strong. But we know, Lord, we have the history, God, we know the miracles and exploits that you've done through people in times gone by. But Lord, this is another day. This is our time, oh God. And we know that you have all power and authority and everything is in your hand. 
We know that we can't live this Christian life without the Holy Spirit. And so God, we give you the right. We invite you, we say blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and we open the gates wide to our hearts, to our homes, Lord, to our minds, to our practice, to, to what we are and how we think and where we go. And we say blessed is he who comes, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, come. Oh Holy Spirit, come. Fill the temple, oh God. Fill the temple, Lord. Your body, your dwelling place on the earth. Oh God Almighty. Fill every part of these temples, Lord. Carry us, sustain us, Lord, and be glorified through us. Be glorified, Jesus Christ. Son of God, be glorified. Oh, Lord, we thank you for forgiveness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your willingness to come to us in our struggle and to be God to us and to be a friend to us and to be strength to us. We come to you, all we can bring to you is a desire to be honest and to walk right and to do your will. That's all we have, Lord, but we bring it to you, Lord. And we ask you to multiply it, God, and feed thousands of people with it, Lord. I pray today that some of the weakest at this altar become some of the strongest in New York City. Not by might nor by power, but by your spirit. We ask you today, oh God, to ignite your churches in the city, Lord. Let prayer meetings erupt everywhere, everywhere, every block. Let there be a prayer meeting. Let there be hardly a place in the city where you can't find one. God Almighty, in your mercy, Lord, in your mercy, in your mercy, visit the city, oh God. Visit the city, Lord Jesus Christ. We can't make it happen, Lord, but we can call out to you, Lord. We know you're able. Heaven is your throne and the earth is your footstool. The nations are a drop in the bucket in your sight. The hearts of kings are in your hand, oh God. With you all things are possible, Lord. So all we do is cry out to you, Lord. Come and do the impossible again. Lord, we won't touch the glory. It doesn't belong to us, Lord. It belongs to you. We know what we are without you, Lord. But we believe that in you all things are possible. Oh, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, salt the streets of the city today with this church. Salt the streets, oh my God. Salt the streets, Lord. Bring light into darkened places. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Bless God, bless God, bless God. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Jesus said, if, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Now, ask for the right reasons, and you can expect God to answer you. You can expect him to answer you speedily. It can happen to you when you least expect it. He'll wake you up in the middle of the night to draw you into his presence but you know that God's going to answer this cry of your heart. If you have a heart that walk honestly, God is going to meet you. I want you to know before you go today, you are greatly loved of God. And let that love draw you to him. Let that be the reason why you come and say, Lord, I want to serve you. Because if you're willing to love me in my pitiful condition, you're willing to love this whole city. And I have to be a witness of that. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. God bless you.